Apostolic Constitutions, Book 2, Section 1. But concerning bishops, we have heard from our Lord that a pastor who is to be ordained a bishop for the churches in every parish must be unblameable, unreprovable, free from all kinds of wickedness common among men, not under fifty years of age. For such a one is in good part past youthful disorders and the slanders of the heathen, as well as the reproaches which are sometimes cast upon many persons by some false brethren, who do not consider the word of God in the gospel, whosoever speaks an idle word shall give an account thereof to the Lord in the day of judgment. And again, by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Let him therefore, if it is possible, be well educated. But if he be unlettered, let him at any rate be skillful in the word, and of competent age. But if in a small parish one advanced in years is not to be found, let some younger person, who has a good report among his neighbors, and is esteemed by them worthy of the office of a bishop, who has carried himself from his youth with meekness and regularity, like a much elder person, after examination and a general good report, be ordained in peace. For Solomon at twelve years of age was king of Israel, and Josiah at eight years of age reigned righteously, and in like manner Joash governed the people at seven years of age. Wherefore, although the person be young, let him be meek, gentle, and quiet. For the Lord God says by Isaiah, Upon whom will I look, but upon him who is humble and quiet and always trembles at my words? In like manner it is in the gospel also, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let him also be merciful, for again it is said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Let him also be a peacemaker, for again it is said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Let him also be one of a good conscience, purified from all evil and wickedness and unrighteousness. For it is said again, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let him therefore be sober, prudent, decent, Firm, stable, not given to wine. No striker, but gentle, not a brawler, not covetous, not a novice, lest by being puffed up with pride he fall into condemnation and the snare of the devil. For every one that exalts himself shall be abased. Such a one a bishop ought to be, who has been the husband of one wife, who also has herself had no other husband, ruling well in his own house. In this manner let examination be made when he is to receive ordination, and to be placed in his bishopric, whether he be grave, faithful, decent, whether he has a grave and faithful wife, or has formerly had such a one, whether he has educated his children piously and has brought them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, whether his domestics do fear and reverence him, and are all obedient to him. For if those who are immediately about him for worldly concerns are seditious and disobedient, how will others not of his family, when they are under his management, become obedient to him? Let examination also be made whether he be unblameable as to the concerns of his life. For it is written, Search diligently for all the faults of him who is to be ordained for the priesthood. Section 2. On which account, let him also be void of anger. For wisdom says, Anger destroys even the prudent. Let him also be merciful, of a generous and loving temper. For our Lord says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Let him be also ready to give, a lover of the widow and stranger, ready to serve and minister and attend, resolute in his duty, and let him know who is the most worthy of his assistance. For if there be a widow who is able to support herself, and another woman who is not a widow, but is needy by reason of sickness or the bringing up many children, or infirmity of her hands, let him stretch out his hand in charity rather to this latter. But if anyone be in want by gluttony, drunkenness, or idleness, he does not deserve any assistance or to be esteemed a member of the church of God. For the scripture speaking of such persons says, The slothful hides his hand in his bosom and is not able to bring it to his mouth again. And again, the sluggard folds up his hands and eats his own flesh. For every drunkard and whoremonger shall come into poverty, and every drowsy person shall be clothed with tatters and rags. And in another passage, If you give your eyes to drinking and cups, you shall afterwards walk more naked than a pestle. For certainly idleness is the mother of famine. A bishop must be no acceptor of persons, neither revering nor flattering a rich man, contrary to what is right, nor overlooking nor domineering over a poor man. For, says God to Moses, you shall not accept the person of the rich, nor shall you pity a poor man in his cause, for the judgment is the Lord's. And again, you shall with exact justice follow that which is right. Let a bishop be frugal and contented with a little in his meat and drink, that he may be ever in a sober frame and disposed to instruct and admonish the ignorant, and let him not be costly in his diet, a pamperer of himself, given to pleasure or fond of delicacies. 
Let him be patient and gentle in his admonitions, well instructed himself, meditating in and diligently studying the Lord's books and reading them frequently, that so he may be able to carefully interpret the scriptures, expounding the gospel in correspondence with the prophets and with the law. And let the expositions from the law and the prophets correspond to the gospel. For the Lord Jesus says, Search the scriptures, for they are those which testify of me. And again, for Moses wrote of me. But above all, let him carefully distinguish between the original law and the additional precepts, and show which are the laws for believers, and which the bonds for the unbelievers, lest any should fall under those bonds. Be careful, therefore, O bishop, to study the word, that you may be able to explain everything exactly, and that you may copiously nourish your people with much doctrine, and enlighten them with the light of the law. For God says, Enlighten yourselves with the light of knowledge, while we have yet opportunity. Let not a bishop be given to filthy lucre, especially before the Gentiles, rather suffering than offering injuries, not covetous, nor rapacious, no purloiner, no admirer of the rich, nor hater of the poor, no evil speaker, nor false witness, nor given to anger, no brawler, not entangled with the affairs of this life, not a surety for anyone, nor an accuser in suits about money, not ambitious, not double-minded, nor double-tongued, not ready to hearken to calumny or evil speaking, not a dissembler, not addicted to the heathen festivals, not given to vain deceits, not eager after worldly things, nor a lover of money. For all these things are opposite to God and pleasing to demons. Let the bishop earnestly give all these precepts in charge to the laity also, persuading them to imitate his conduct. For, says he, make the children of Israel pious. Let him be prudent, humble, apt to admonish with the instructions of the Lord, well disposed, one who has renounced all the wicked projects of this world and all heathenish lusts. Let him be orderly, sharp in observing the wicked and taking heed of them, but a friend to all, just, discerning, and whatsoever qualities are commendable among men, let the bishop possess them in himself. For if the pastor be unblameable as to any wickedness, he will compel his own disciples, and by his very mode of life, press them to become worthy imitators of his own actions. As the prophet somewhere says, and it will be, as is the priest, so is the people. For our Lord and teacher Jesus Christ, the Son of God, began first to do and then to teach, as Luke somewhere says, which Jesus began to do and to teach. Wherefore he says, Whosoever shall do and teach, he shall be called great in the kingdom of God. For you bishops are to be guides and watchmen to the people, as you yourselves have Christ for your guide and watchman. You should therefore become good guides and watchmen to the people of God. For the Lord says by Ezekiel, speaking to every one of you, Son of man, I have given you for a watchman to the house of Israel. And you shall hear the word from my mouth, and shall observe, and shall declare it from me. When I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die, if you do not speak to warn the wicked from his wickedness, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, and his blood will I require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked from his way, that he may turn from it, and he does not turn from it, he shall die in his iniquity, and you have delivered your soul. In the same manner, if the sword of war be approaching, and the people set a watchman to watch, and he sees the same approach, and does not forewarn them, and the sword come and take one of them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood shall be required at the watchman's hand, because he did not blow the trumpet. But if he blew the trumpet, and he who heard it would not take warning, and the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon him, because he heard the trumpet and took not warning. But he who took warning has delivered his soul, and the watchman, because he gave warning, shall surely live. The sword here is the judgment. The trumpet is the holy gospel. The watchman is the bishop, who is set in the church, who is obliged by his preaching to testify and vehemently to forewarn concerning that judgment. If you do not declare and testify this to the people, the sins of those who are ignorant of it will be found upon you. Wherefore do you warn and reprove the uninstructed with boldness? Teach the ignorant. Confirm those that understand. Bring back those that go astray. If we repeat the very same things on the same occasions, brethren, we shall not do amiss. For by frequent hearing it is to be hoped that some will be made ashamed, and at least do some good action, and avoid some wicked one. For says God to the prophet, Testify those things to them, perhaps they will hear your voice. And again, if perhaps they will hear, if perhaps they will submit. Moses also says to the people, If hearing you will hear the Lord God, and do that which is good and right in his eyes. And again, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And our Lord is often recorded in the gospel to have said, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And why Solomon says, My son, 
Hear the instruction of your father, and reject not the laws of your mother. And indeed, to this day men have not heard. For while they seem to have heard, they have not heard aright, as appears by their having left the one and only true God, and their being drawn into destructive and dangerous heresies, concerning which we shall speak again afterwards. Section 3 Beloved, be it known to you that those who are baptized into the death of our Lord Jesus are obliged to go on no longer in sin. For as those who are dead cannot work wickedness any longer, so those who are dead with Christ cannot practice wickedness. We do not therefore believe, brethren, that anyone who has received the washing of life continues in the practice of the licentious acts of transgressors. Now he who sins after his baptism, unless he repent and forsake his sins, shall be condemned to hellfire. But if anyone be maliciously prosecuted by the heathen, because he will not still go along with them to do the same excess of riot, let him know that such a one is blessed of God, according as our Lord says in the Gospel. Blessed are you when men shall reproach you or persecute you, or say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for your reward is great in heaven. If therefore anyone be slandered and falsely accused, such a one is blessed. For the scripture says, A man that is reprobate is not tried by God. But if anyone be convicted as having done a wicked action, such a one not only hurts himself, but occasions the whole body of the church and its doctrine to be blasphemed. As if we Christians did not practice those things that we declare to be good and honest, and we ourselves shall be reproached by the Lord, that they say and do not. Wherefore the bishop must boldly reject such as these upon full conviction, unless they change their course of life. For the bishop must not only give himself no offense, but must be no respecter of persons, in meekness instructing those that offend. But if he himself has not a good conscience, and is a respecter of persons for the sake of filthy lucre, and receiving of bribes, and spares the open offender, and permits him to continue in the church, he disregards the voice of God and of our Lord, which says, You shall exactly execute right judgment. You shall not accept persons in judgment. You shall not justify the ungodly. You shall not receive gifts against anyone's life, for gifts do blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. And elsewhere he says, Take away from among yourselves that wicked person. And Solomon says in his Proverbs, Cast out a pestilent fellow from the congregation, and strife will go out along with him. But he who does not consider these things will, contrary to justice, spare him who deserves punishment, as Saul spared Agag, and Eli his sons, who knew not the Lord. Such a one profanes his own dignity, and that church of God which is in his parish. Such a one is esteemed unjust before God and holy men, as affording occasion of scandal to many of the newly baptized, and to the catechumens, as also to the youth of both sexes, to whom a woe belongs, add a millstone about his neck, and drowning on account of his guilt. For observing what a person their governor is, through his wickedness and neglect of justice, they will grow skeptical, and indulging in the same disease will be compelled to perish with him, as was the case of the people joining with Jeroboam, and those which were in the conspiracy with Korah. But if the offender sees that the bishop and deacons are innocent and unblameable, and the flock pure, he will either not venture to despise their authority, and to enter into the church of God at all, as one smitten by his own conscience, or if he values nothing, and ventures to enter in, either he will be convicted immediately, as Uzzah at the ark when he touched it to support it, and as Achan when he stole the accursed thing, and as Gehazi when he coveted the money of Naaman, and so will be immediately punished, or else he will be admonished by the pastor and drawn to repentance. For when he looks round the whole church one by one and can spy no blemish, neither in the bishop nor in the people who are under his care, he will be put to confusion and pricked at the heart, and in a peaceable manner will go his way with shame and many tears, and the flock will remain pure. He will apply himself to God with tears and will repent of his sins and have hope. Nay, the whole flock at the sight of his tears will be instructed, because a sinner avoids destruction by repentance. Upon this account, therefore, O bishop, Endeavor to be pure in your actions, and to adorn your place and dignity, which is that of one sustaining the character of God among men, as being set over all men, over priests, kings, rulers, fathers, children, teachers, and in general over all those who are subject to you. And so sit in the church when you speak as having authority to judge offenders. For to you, O bishops, it is said, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven." Therefore, O bishop, judge with authority like God, yet receive the penitent, for God is a God of mercy. Rebuke those that sin, admonish those that are not converted, exhort those that stand to persevere in their goodness. Receive the penitent, 
For the Lord God has promised with an oath to afford remission to the penitent for what things they have done amiss. For he says by Ezekiel, Speak unto them, As I live, says the Lord, I would not the death of a sinner, but that the wicked turn from his evil way and live. Turn therefore from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Here the word affords hope to sinners, that if they will repent, they shall have hope of salvation, lest otherwise out of despair they yield themselves up to their transgressions, but that having hope of salvation, they may be converted, and may address to God with tears on account of their sins, and may repent from their hearts, and so appease his displeasure towards them. So shall they receive a pardon from him, as from a merciful father. Yet it is very necessary that those who are yet innocent should continue so, and not make an experiment what sin is, that they may not have occasion for trouble, sorrow, and those lamentations which are in order to forgiveness. For how do you know, O man, when you sin, whether you shall live any number of days in this present state, that you may have time to repent? For the time of your departure out of this world is uncertain, and if you die in sin, there will remain no repentance for you, as God says by David, in the grave, who will confess to you? It behooves us, therefore, to be ready in the doing of our duty, that so we may await our passage into another world without sorrow. Wherefore also the divine word exhorts, speaking to you with a wise Solomon, prepare your works against your exit, and provide all beforehand in the field, lest some of the things necessary to your journey be wanting, as the oil of piety was, deficient in the five foolish virgins mentioned in the gospel, when they, on account of their having extinguished their lamps of divine knowledge, were shut out of the bride chamber. Wherefore, he who values the security of his soul will take care to be out of danger by keeping free from sin, that so he may preserve the advantage of his former good works to himself. Therefore, so judge is executing judgment for God. For as the scripture says, the judgment is the Lord's. In the first place, therefore, condemn the guilty person with authority. Afterwards, try to bring him home with mercy and compassion and readiness to receive him promising him salvation if he will change his course of life and become a penitent. And when he does repent and has submitted to his chastisement, receive him, remembering that our Lord has said, there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. But if you refuse to receive him that repents, you expose him to those who lie and wait to destroy, forgetting what David says, deliver not my soul, which confesses to you unto destroying beasts. Wherefore Jeremiah, when he was exhorting men to repentance, says thus, Shall not he that falls arise? Or he that turns away, cannot he return? Wherefore have my people gone back by a shameless backsliding, and they are hardened in their purpose? Turn, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Receive therefore without any doubting him that repents. Be not hindered by such unmerciful men, who say that we must not be defiled with such as those, nor so much as speak to them. For such advice is from men that are unacquainted with God and his providence, and are unreasonable judges and unmerciful brutes. These men are ignorant that we ought to avoid society with offenders, not in discourse, but in actions. For the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And again, if a land sins against me by trespassing grievously, and I stretch out my hand upon it, and break the staff of bread upon it, and send famine upon it, and destroy man and beast therein, though these three men, Noah, Job, and Daniel, were in the midst of it, they shall only save their own souls by their righteousness, says the Lord God. The scripture most clearly shows that a righteous man that converses with a wicked man does not perish with him. For in the present world, the righteous and the wicked are mingled together in the common affairs of life, but not in holy communion. And in this, the friends and favorites of God are guilty of no sin. For they do but imitate their father, which is in heaven, who makes his son to rise on the righteous and unrighteous and sends his reign on the evil and on the good. And the righteous man undergoes no peril on this account. For those who conquer and those who are conquered are in the same place of running, but only those who have bravely undergone the race are where the garland is bestowed, and no one is crowned unless he strive lawfully. For everyone shall give account of himself, and God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. For with him it is a constant rule that innocence is never punished. For neither did he drown Noah, nor burn up Lot, nor destroy Rahab for company. And if you desire to know how this matter was among us, Judas was one of us, and took the like part of the ministry which we had. And Simon the magician received the seal of the Lord. Yet both the one and the other proving wicked, the former hanged himself, and the latter, as he flew in the air in a manner unnatural, was dashed against the earth. Moreover, Noah and his sons with him were in the ark. But Ham, who alone was found wicked, received punishment in his son. But if fathers are not punished for their children, nor children for their fathers, it is thence clear that neither will wives be punished for their husbands, nor servants for their masters, nor one relation for another, 
nor one friend for another, nor the righteous for the wicked. But every one will be required an account of his own doing. For neither was punishment inflicted on Noah for the world, nor was Lot destroyed by fire for the Sodomites, nor was Rahab slain for the inhabitants of Jericho, nor Israel for the Egyptians. For not the dwelling together, but the agreement in their sentiments, alone could condemn the righteous with the wicked. We ought not therefore to hearken to such persons who call for death, and hate mankind, and love accusations, and under fair pretenses bring man to death. For one man shall not die for another, but every one is held with the chains of his own sins. And behold, the man and his work is before his face. Now we ought to assist those who are with us, and are in danger, and fall, and as far as lies in our power to reduce them to sobriety by our exhortations, and so save them from death. For the whole have no need of the physician, but the sick, since it is not pleasing in the sight of your father that one of these little ones should perish. For we ought not to establish the will of hard-hearted men, but the will of the God and Father of the universe, which is revealed to us by Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever. Amen. For it is not equitable that you, O bishop, who art the head, should submit to the tale, that is to some seditious person among the laity, to the destruction of another, but to God alone. For it is your privilege to govern those under you, but not to be governed by them. For neither does a son who is subject to the course of generation govern his father, nor a slave who is subject by law govern his master, nor does a scholar govern his teacher, nor a soldier his king, nor any of the laity his bishop. For that there is no reason to suppose that such as converse with the wicked, in order to their instruction in the word, are defiled by or partake of their sins. Ezekiel, as it were on purpose, preventing the suspicions of ill-disposed persons, says thus, Why do you speak this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall not henceforth have occasion to use this proverb in Israel. For all souls are mine. In like manner as the soul of the father, so also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. But the man who is righteous and does judgment and justice, and so the prophet reckons up the rest of the virtues and then adds for a conclusion, such a one is just, he shall surely live, says the Lord God. And if he beget a son who is a robber, a shedder of blood, and walks not in the way of his righteous father, and when the prophet had added what follows, he adds in the conclusion, he shall certainly not live. He has done all this wickedness, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. And they will ask you, why? Does not the son bear the iniquity of the father, or his righteousness, having exercised righteousness and mercy himself? And you shall say unto them, The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, and the father shall not bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And a little after he says, When the righteous turns away from his righteousness, and commits iniquity, all his righteousness, by reason of all his wickedness which he has committed, shall not be mentioned to him. In his iniquity which he has committed, and in his sin which he has sinned, in them shall he die. And a little after he adds, When the wicked turns away from his wickedness which he has committed, and does judgment and justice, he has preserved his soul. He has turned away from all his ungodliness which he has done. He shall surely live. He shall not die. And afterwards I will judge every one of you according to his ways, O house of Israel, says the Lord God. Observe, you who are our beloved sons, how merciful yet righteous the Lord our God is, how gracious and kind to men. And yet most certainly he will not acquit the guilty. Though he welcomes the returning sinner and revives him, leaving no room for suspicion to such as wish to judge sternly and to reject offenders entirely, and to refuse to vouchsafe to them exhortations which might bring them to repentance, in contradiction to such, God by Isaiah says to the bishops, Comfort, comfort my people, you priests. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem. It therefore behooves you upon hearing those words of his to encourage those who have offended and lead them to repentance and afford them hope and not vainly to suppose that you shall be partakers of their offenses on account of such your love to them. Receive the penitent with alacrity and rejoice over them and with mercy and bowels of compassion judge the sinners. For if a person was walking by the side of a river and ready to stumble and you should push him and thrust him into the river instead of offering him your hand for his assistance, you would be guilty of the murder of your brother. Whereas you ought rather to lend your helping hand, as he was ready to fall, lest he perish without remedy, that both the people may take warning, and the offender may not utterly perish. It is your duty, O bishop, neither to overlook the sins of the people, nor to reject those who are penitent, that you may not unskillfully destroy the Lord's flock, or dishonor his new name, which is imposed on his people. And you yourself be as reproached as those ancient pastors were, of whom God speaks thus to Jeremiah, Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard, they have polluted my heritage." 
And in another passage, my anger is growing hot against the shepherds, and against the lambs shall I have indignation. And elsewhere, you are the priests that dishonor my name. When you see the offender with severity commanded to be cast out, and as he's going out, let the deacons also treat him with severity. And then let them go and seek for him, and detain him out of the church. And when they come in, let them entreat you for him. For our Savior himself entreated his Father for those who had sinned, as it is written in the Gospel, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then order the offender to come in, and if upon examination you find that he is penitent, and fit to be received at all into the church when you have afflicted him his days of fasting, according to the degree of his offense, as two, three, five, or seven weeks, so set him at liberty, and speak such things to him as are fit to be said in way of reproof, instruction, and exhortation to a sinner for his reformation, that so he may continue privately in his humility, and pray to God to be merciful to him, saying, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who should stand? For with you there is propitiation. If this sort of declaration is that which is said in the book of Genesis to Cain, you have sinned, be quiet, that is, do not go on and sin. For that a sinner ought to be ashamed for his own sin, that oracle of God delivered to Moses concerning Miriam, is a sufficient proof, when he prayed that she might be forgiven. For God says to him, If her father had spit in her face, should she not be ashamed? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and afterwards let her come in. We therefore ought to do so with offenders, when they profess their repentance, namely to separate them some determinate time, according to the proportion of their offense, and afterwards, like fathers to children, receive them again upon their repentance. But if the bishop himself be an offender, how will he be able any longer to prosecute the offense of another? Or how will he be able to reprove another, either he or his deacons, if by accepting of persons or receiving of bribes they have not all a clear conscience? For when the ruler asks and the judge receives, judgment is not brought to perfection. But when both are companions of thieves and regardless of doing justice to the widows, those who are under the bishop will not be able to support and vindicate him. For they will say to him what is written in the gospel, Why do you behold the mote that is in your brother's eye? But consider us not the beam that is in your own eye. Let the bishop, therefore, with his deacons, dread to bear any such thing, that is, let him give no occasion for it. For an offender, when he sees any other doing as bad as himself, will be encouraged to do the very same things. And then the wicked one, taking occasion from a single instance, works in others which God forbid. And by that means the flock will be destroyed. For the greater number of offenders there are, the greater is the mischief that is done by them. For sin which passes without correction grows worse and worse, and spreads to others, since a little leaven infects the whole lump. And one thief spreads the abomination over a whole nation, and dead flies spoil the whole pot of sweet ointment. And when a king hearkens to unrighteous counsel, all the servants under him are wicked. So one scabbed sheep, if not separate from those that are whole, infects the rest with the same distemper. And a man infected with the plague is to be avoided by all men. And a mad dog is dangerous to everyone that he touches. If therefore we neglect to separate the transgressor from the church of God, we shall make the Lord's house a den of thieves. For it is the bishop's duty not to be silent in the case of offenders, but to rebuke them, to exhort them, to beat them down, to afflict them with fastings, that so he might strike a pious dread into the rest. For as he says, make the children of Israel pious. For the bishop must be one who discourages sin by his exhortations, and sets a pattern of righteousness, and proclaims those good things which are prepared by God, and declares that wrath which will come at the day of judgment, lest he condemn and neglect the plantation of God, and on account of his carelessness, hear that which is said to Hosea, why have you held your peace at impiety, and have reaped the fruit thereof? Let the bishop therefore extend his concern to all sorts of people, to those who have not offended, that they may continue innocent, to those who offend, that they may repent. For to you does the Lord speak thus, Take heed that you offend not one of these little ones. It is your duty also to give remission to the penitent. For as soon as ever one who has offended says, in the sincerity of his soul, I have sinned against the Lord, the Holy Spirit answers, The Lord also has forgiven your sin. Be of good cheer, you shall not die. Be sensible, therefore, O bishop, of the dignity of your place, that as you have received the power of binding, so have you also that of loosing. Having, therefore, the power of loosing, know yourself, and behave yourself in this world as becomes your place, being aware that you have a great account to give. For to whom, as the scripture says, men have entrusted much, of him they will require the more. For no one man is free from sin, excepting him that was made man for us. Since it is written, No man is pure from filthiness, no, not though he be but one day old. Upon which account the lives and conduct of the ancient holy men and patriarchs are described, not that we may reproach them from our reading, but that we ourselves may repent, and have hope that we also shall obtain forgiveness. For their blemishes are to us both security and admonition, because we hence learn, when we have offended, that if we repent, 
we shall have pardon. For it is written, Who can boast that he has a clean heart, and who dare affirm that he is pure from sin? No man, therefore, is without sin. Therefore labor to the utmost of your power to be unblameable, and be solicitous of all the parts of your flock, lest any one be scandalized on your account and thereby perish. For the layman is solicitous only for himself, but you for all, as having a greater burden and carrying a heavier load. For it is written, and the Lord said to Moses, You and Aaron shall bear the sins of the priesthood. Since therefore you are to give an account of all, take care of all. Preserve those that are sound, admonish those that sin, and when you have afflicted them with fasting, give them ease by remission. And when with tears the offender begs readmission, receive him, and let the whole church pray for him. And when by imposition of your hand you have admitted him, give him leave to abide afterwards in the flock. But for the drowsy and the careless, endeavor to convert and confirm, and warn and cure them. As sensible how great a reward you shall have for doing so, and how great danger you will incur if you are negligent therein. For Ezekiel speaks thus to those overseers who take no care of the people. Woe unto the shepherds of Israel, for they have fed themselves. The shepherds feed not the sheep, but themselves. You eat the milk, and are clothed with the wool. You slay the strong, you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but violently you chastised them with insult, and they were scattered, because there was no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the forest. And again, the shepherds did not search for my sheep, and the shepherds fed themselves, but they fed not my sheep. And a little after, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hands, and cause them to cease from feeding my sheep. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. And I will deliver my sheep out of their hands, and they shall not be meat for them. And he also adds, speaking to the people, Behold, I will judge between sheep and sheep, and between rams and rams. Seemed it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, and to have trodden down with your feet the residue of your pasture, and that the sheep have eaten what was trodden down with your feet. And a little after he adds, And you shall know that I am the Lord, and you the sheep of my pasture. You are my men, and I am your God, says the Lord God. Hear, O you bishops, and hear, O you of the laity, how God speaks. I will judge between ram and ram, and between sheep and sheep. And he says to the shepherds, You shall be judged for your unskillfulness, and for destroying the sheep. That is, I will judge between one bishop and another, and between one layperson and another. And between one ruler and another, for these sheep and these rams are not irrational, but rational creatures, lest at any time a layperson should say, I am a sheep and not a shepherd, and I am not concerned for myself, let the shepherd look to that, for he alone will be required to give an account for me. For as that sheep that will not follow its good shepherd is exposed to the wolves, to its destruction, so that which follows a bad shepherd is also exposed to unavoidable death, since his shepherd will devour him. Wherefore care must be had to avoid destructive shepherds. As to a good shepherd, let the layperson honor him, love him, reverence him as his Lord, as his master, as the high priest of God, as a teacher of piety. For he that hears him hears Christ, and he that rejects him rejects Christ, and he who does not receive Christ does not receive his God and Father. For, says he, he that hears you hears me, and he that rejects you rejects me, and he that rejects me rejects him that sent me. In like manner let the bishop love the laity as his children, fostering and cherishing them with affectionate diligence as eggs in order to the hatching of young ones, or as young ones taking them in his arms to the rearing them into birds, admonishing all men, reproving all who stand in need of reproof, reproving that is but not striking, beating them down to make them ashamed but not overthrowing them, warning them in order to their conversion, chiding them in order to their reformation and better course of life, watching the strong, that is, keeping him firm in the faith who is already strong, feeding the people peaceably, strengthening the weak, that is, confirming with exhortation that which is tempted, healing that which is sick, that is, curing by instruction that which is weak in the faith, through doubtfulness of mind, binding up that which is broken, that is, binding up by comfortable admonitions that which has gone astray, or wounded, bruised, or broken by their sins, and put out of the way, loosing it of its offenses and giving hope. But this means to restore it in strength to the church, bringing it back to the flock. Bring again that which is driven away, That is, do not permit that which is in its sins and is cast out by way of punishment to continue excluded, but receiving it and bringing it back, restore it to the flock, that is, to the people of the undefiled church. Seek for that which is lost. That is, do not suffer that which desponds of its salvation, by reason of the multitude of its offenses, utterly to perish. Search for that which has grown sleepy, drowsy, and sluggish, and that which is unmindful of its own life, through the deep of its sleep, and which is at great distance from its own flock, so as to be in danger of falling among the wolves and being devoured by them. Bring it back by admonition, exhort it to be watchful, and insinuate hope, not permitting it to say that which was said by some, our impieties are upon us, and we pine away in them. 
how shall we then live? As far as possible, therefore, let the bishop make the offense his own, and say to the sinner, Do thou but return, and I will undertake to suffer death for you, as our Lord suffered death for me and for all men. For the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming, that is, the devil, and he leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf seizes upon them. We must know, therefore, that God is very merciful to those who have offended, and has promised repentance with an oath. But he who has offended and is unacquainted with this promise of God concerning repentance, and does not understand his long-suffering and forbearance, and besides is ignorant of the Holy Scriptures which proclaim repentance, inasmuch as he has never learned them from you, perishes through his folly. But like a compassionate shepherd and a diligent feeder of the flock, search out and keep an account of your flock. Seek that which is wanting, as the Lord God, our gracious Father, has sent his own Son, the Good Shepherd and Savior, our Master, Jesus, and has commanded him to leave the ninety-nine upon the mountains, and go in search after that which was lost. And when he had found it, to take it upon his shoulders, and to carry it into the flock, rejoicing that he had found that which was lost. In like manner be obedient to a bishop, and seek that which was lost. Guide that which has wandered out of the right way. Bring back that which has gone astray. For you have authority to bring them back, and to deliver those that are broken-hearted by remission. For by you does our Savior say to him who is discouraged under the sense of his sins, Your sins are forgiven you, your faith has saved you, go in peace. But this peace and haven of tranquility is the church of Christ, into which do you, when you have loosed them from their sins, restore them, as being now sound and unblameable, of good hope, diligent, laborious and good works. As a skillful and compassionate physician, heal all such as have wandered in the ways of sin. For they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Since you are therefore a physician of the Lord's church, provide remedies suitable to every patient's case. Cure them, heal them, by all means possible. Restore them sound to the church. Feed the flock, not with insolence and contempt as lording it over them, but as a gentle shepherd, gathering the lambs into your bosom and gently leading those which are with young. Be gentle, gracious, mild, without guile, without falsehood, not rigid, not insolent, not severe, not arrogant, not unmerciful, not puffed up, not a man-pleaser, not timorous, not double-minded, not one that insults over the people that are under you, not one that conceals the divine laws and the promises to repentance, not hasty in thrusting out and expelling, but steady, not one that delights in severity, not heady. Do not admit less evidence to convict anyone than that of three witnesses and those of known and established reputation. Inquire whether they do not accuse out of ill will or envy, for there are many that delight in mischief, forward in discourse, slanderous, haters of the brethren, making it their business to scatter the sheep of Christ, whose affirmation, if you admit without nice scanning the same, you will disperse your flock and betray it to be devoured by wolves, that is, by demons and wicked men, or rather not men, but wild beasts in the shape of men, by the heathen, by the Jews, and by the atheistic heretics. For those destroying wolves soon address themselves to anyone that is cast out of the church and esteem him as a lamb delivered for them to devour, reckoning his destruction their own gain." For he that is their father, the devil, is a murderer. He also, who is separated unjustly by your want of care and judging, will be overwhelmed with sorrow and be disconsolate, and so will either wander over to the heathen or be entangled in heresies, and so will be altogether estranged from the church and from hope in God, and will be entangled in impiety, whereby you will be guilty of his perdition. For it is not fair to be too hasty in cutting off an offender, but slow in receiving him when he returns, to be forward in cutting off, but unmerciful when he is sorrowful and ought to be healed. For of such as these speaks the divine scripture, their feet run to mischief, they are hasty to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. The fear of God is not before their eyes. Now the way of peace is our Savior Jesus Christ, who has taught us, saying, Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given to you. That is, give remission of sins, and your offenses shall be forgiven you. And also he instructed us by his prayer to say unto God, Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. If therefore you do not forgive offenders, how can you expect the remission of your own sins? Do not you rather bind yourselves faster by pretending in your prayers to forgive when you really do not forgive? Will you not be confronted with your own words when you say you forgive and do not forgive? For know that he who casts out one who has not behaved himself wickedly or who will not receive him that returns is a murderer of his brother and sheds his blood as Cain did that of his brother Abel and his blood cries to God and will be required. For a righteous man unjustly slain by any one will be in rest with God forever, the same as the case of him who without cause is separated by his bishop. He who has cast him out as a pestilent fellow when he was innocent is more furious than a murderer. 
such a one has no regard to the mercy of God, nor is mindful of his goodness to those that are penitent, nor keeping in his eye the examples of those who, having been once great offenders, receive forgiveness upon their repentance, upon which account he who casts off an innocent person is more cruel than he that murders the body. In like manner, he who does not receive the penitent scatters the flock of Christ, being really against him. For as God is just in judging of sinners, so is he merciful in receiving them when they return. For David, the man after God's own heart, in his hymns, ascribes both mercy and judgment to him. It is also your duty, O bishop, to have before your eyes the examples of those that have gone before, and to apply them skillfully to the cases of those who want words of severity or of consolation. Besides, it is reasonable that in your administration of justice you should follow the will of God, and as God deals with sinners and with those who return, that you should act accordingly in your judging. Now, did not God by Nathan reproach David for his offense? And yet as soon as he said he repented, he delivered him from death, saying, Be of good cheer, you shall not die. So also when God had caused Jonah to be swallowed up by the sea and the whale, upon his refusal to preach to the Ninevites, when yet he prayed to him out of the belly of the whale, he retrieved his life from corruption. And when Hezekiah had been puffed up for a while, yet as soon as he prayed with lamentation, he remitted his offense. But, O you bishops, hearken to an instance useful upon this occasion. For it is written thus in the fourth book of Kings and the second book of Chronicles, And Hezekiah died, and Manasseh his son reigned. He was twelve years old when he began to reign, and he reigned fifty and five years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not abstain from the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord destroyed from the face of the children of Israel. And Manasseh returned and built the high places which Hezekiah his father had overthrown. And he reared pillars for Baal, and set up an altar for Baal, and made groves as did Ahab king of Israel. And he made altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord spoke to David and Solomon his son, saying, Therein will I put my name. And Manasseh set up altars, and by them served Baal, and said, My name shall continue forever. And he built altars to the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his children pass through the fire in a place named geb And he consulted enchanters and dealt with wizards and familiar spirits and with conjurers and observers of times and with teraphim. And he sinned exceedingly in the eyes of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a molten and a graven image, the image of his grove which he made in the house of the Lord, wherein the Lord had chosen to put his name in Jerusalem, the holy city, forever, and had said, I will no more remove my foot from the land of Israel, which I gave to their fathers, only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to all the precepts that my servant Moses commanded them. And if they hearkened not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil before the Lord than did the nations whom the Lord cast out from the face of the children of Israel. And the Lord spoke concerning Manasseh and concerning his people by the hand of his servants the prophets, saying, because Manasseh king of Judah has done all these wicked abominations in a higher degree than the Amorite did which was before him, and has made Judah to sin with his idols, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I bring evils upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever hears of them, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria, and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will blot out Jerusalem, as a table book is blotted out by wiping it. And I will turn it upside down, and I will give up the remnant of my inheritance, and will deliver them in the hands of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies, because of all the evils which they have done in my eyes, and have provoked me to anger from the day that I brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much, till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, beside his sins, wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord brought upon him the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, and they caught Manasseh in bonds, and they bound him in fetters of brass, and brought him to Babylon, and he was bound and shackled with iron all over in the house of prison. And bread made of bran was given unto him scantily and by weight, and water mixed with vinegar, but a little and by measure, so much as would keep him alive. And he was in straits and sore affliction. And when he was violently afflicted, he besought the face of the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the face of the Lord God of his fathers. And he prayed unto the Lord, saying, O Lord, Almighty God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of the righteous seed, who has made heaven and earth, with all the ornament thereof, who has bound the sea by the word of your commandment, who has shut up the deep and sealed it by your terrible and glorious name, whom all men fear and tremble before your power. For the majesty of your glory cannot be borne, and your angry threatening towards sinners is unsupportable. But your merciful promise is unmeasurable and unsearchable. For you are the most high Lord, of great compassion, long-suffering, very merciful, and repentest of the evils of men. You, O Lord, according to your great goodness, have promised repentance and forgiveness to those who have sinned against you and of your infinite mercy have appointed repentance unto sinners, that they may be saved. You therefore, O Lord, that art the God of the just, has not appointed repentance to the just as to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, which have not sinned against you, but you have appointed repentance unto me, that am a sinner. For I have sinned above the number of the sands of the sea, 
My transgressions, O Lord, are multiplied. My transgressions are multiplied. And I am not worthy to behold and see the height of heaven for the multitude of mine iniquity. I am bowed down with many iron bands, for I have provoked your wrath and done evil before you, setting up abominations and multiplying offenses. Now therefore I bow the knee of my heart, beseeching you of grace. I have sinned, O Lord, I have sinned, and I acknowledge mine iniquities. Wherefore I humbly beseech you, forgive me, O Lord, forgive me, and destroy me not with mine iniquities. Be not angry with me forever by reserving evil for me. Neither condemn me into the lower part of the earth. For you are the God, even the God of those who repent. And in me you will show your goodness. For you will save me that am unworthy according to your great mercy. Therefore I will praise you forever all the days of my life. For all the powers of the heavens do praise you. And yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord heard his voice and had compassion upon him. And there appeared a flame of fire about him, and all the iron shackles and chains which were about him fell off. And the Lord healed Manasseh from his affliction and brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. And Manasseh knew that the Lord, he is God alone. And he worshipped the Lord alone with all his heart and with all his soul all the days of his life, and he was esteemed righteous. And he took away the strange gods and the grave image out of the house of the Lord, and all the altars which he had built in the house of the Lord, and all the altars in Jerusalem, and he cast them out of the city. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings. And Manasseh spoke to Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. And he slept in peace with his fathers, and Ammon his son reigned in his stead. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all things that Manasseh his father had done in the former part of his reign. And he provoked the Lord his God to anger. You have heard, our beloved children, how the Lord God for a while punished him that was addicted to idols, and had slain many innocent persons, and yet that he received him when he repented, and forgave him his offenses, and restored him to his kingdom. For he not only forgives the penitent, but reinstates them in their former dignity. There is no sin more grievous than idolatry, for it is an impiety against God, and yet even this sin has been forgiven, upon sincere repentance. But if any one sin in direct opposition, and on purpose, to try whether God will punish the wicked or not, such a one shall have no remission, although he say with himself, All is well, and I will walk according to the conversation of my evil heart. Such a one was Ammon the son of Manasseh, for the scripture says, And Ammon reasoned an evil reasoning of transgression, and said, My father from his childhood is a great transgressor, and repented in his old age. And now I will walk as my soul lusts, and afterwards I will return unto the Lord. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And the Lord God soon destroyed him utterly from his good land. And his servants conspired against him, and slew him in his own house, and he reigned two years only. Take heed, therefore, you of the laity, lest any one of you fix the reasoning of Ammon in his heart and be suddenly cut off and perish. In the same manner, let the bishop take all the care he can that those which are yet innocent may not fall into sin, and let him heal and receive those which turn from their sins. But if he is pitiless and will not receive the repenting sinner, he will sin against the Lord his God, pretending to be more just than God's justice, and not receiving him whom he has received through Christ, for whose sake he sent his Son upon earth to men as a man. For whose sake God was pleased that he who was the maker of man and woman should be born of a woman. For whose sake he did not spare him from the cross, from death and burial, but permitted him to die, who by nature could not suffer, his beloved son, God the word, the angel of his great counsel, that he might deliver those from death who were obnoxious to death. Him do those provoke to anger who do not receive the penitent. For he was not ashamed of me, Matthew, who had been formerly a publican, and admitted of Peter when he had, through fear, denied him three times, but had appeased him by repentance, and had wept bitterly. Nay, he made him a shepherd to his own lambs. Moreover, he ordained Paul, our fellow apostle, to be a per of a persecutor, an apostle, and declared him a chosen vessel, even when he had heaped many mischiefs upon us before, and had blasphemed his sacred name. He says also to another, a woman that was a sinner, Your sins which are many are forgiven, for you love much. And when the elders had set another woman which had sinned before him, and had left the sentence to him, and had gone out, our Lord, the searcher of the hearts, inquiring of her whether the elders had condemned her, and being answered no, he said to her, Go your way therefore, for neither do I condemn you. This Jesus, O you bishops, our Savior, our King, and our God, ought to be set before you as your pattern. And him you ought to imitate, in being meek, quiet, compassionate, merciful, peaceable, without passion, apt to teach, and diligent to convert, willing to receive and to comfort, no strikers, not soon angry, not injurious, not arrogant, not supercilious, not wine-bibbers, not drunkards, not vainly expensive, not lovers of delicacies, not extravagant, using the gifts of God not as another's but as their own, as good stewards appointed over them, as those who will be required by God to give an account of the same.